Striving Together series. Y'all know something different. Y'all tell me because I don't get to be out here every week. So. But anyway, that's what we're going to do tonight. It's, it's the last one, last lesson, lesson 13 in Striving Together series. And it's Striving to Reach Souls. And our scripture is going to come from Acts 8. But you know, we need to Coming to the end of this, it is a study based on Philippians 1.27. And, you know, we've learned about the teamwork within our local church to carry out God's plan here on this earth. To do what he wants us to do. To carry out his biblical ministry. You know, there's several areas that we all need to work together and fulfill God's call on our lives. You know, serving, giving, praying, and more. I mean, there's a lot of things, you know, we don't ever know what God, you know, I don't know what God has called you to do, but he's called you to do something that you know, he wants you to do that. He wants all of us to do what he wants, you know, what he's delegated for us to do. So you know, if you don't know what that is, just pray hard. You'll find out what God has in store for you and, and all of us. He's, you know, that's the one function of the New Testament church and that is to strive together and to win souls for him. You know, we, we're here not you know, bigger numbers does make it easier for a church to do certain things but the numbers is not the reason we're here other than everyone that we can get saved and bring into God's teaching and learning is another one that's going to heaven. Amen. That's where the numbers count yes. is who goes to heaven not Amen. who's not who's got the most money. I went to a funeral a couple of weeks ago. It was actually Joe's great uncle, uh, Mr. Harold Nicholson. And, you know, I went, shook the hands, I started to leave, but that was one of the most meaningful services I've been to. And it wasn't about how much Harold Nicholson had on this earth, what all he had, it was about what he had done how many lives he had reached. And his son, grandson got up and told you know, him going. They went and ate breakfast and you know, said he bought a bunch of extra biscuits, bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits. And you know, his grandson said, so Papa, what are we going to do with all them biscuits? He said, we're going to give them to people. He said, I can witness to them, and if they come to know the Lord, that would be the cheapest dollar and 25 cent I've ever spent. Best, well best spent. You know, and they're even going to eat breakfast. There's that man thinking about others and saving souls. And he was, I think, 90 years old or 91. And he, you know, still, just no time ago, he was carrying people to the hospital. You know, he's a retired preacher, but he really wasn't retired because he was still doing all the things his whole life. And, you know, it just, it just really touched me that day hearing because that's what it's all about. It's not about having two red trucks or you know or, or whatever I mean those those things are good there's nothing wrong with us having two red trucks or four red trucks but if we you know whatever we have if we use it for God's glory he can give us stuff I mean that's right. sometimes you know if God's people don't have anything they can't accomplish nothing you know if we all you know if everybody come here didn't have a job and didn't have a place to live and didn't make any money how would a church go on? You know, it takes us doing what God wants us to do you know, daily. And that's, you know, but the big thing is, is using it to reach souls. That's why we're here, to reach souls and reach people for Him. You know, we all need to have that passion. We didn't have it too much singing a while ago, but, it, you know, Gene Bartlett that wrote Set My Soul Afire. That's the reason I picked that, because it's in here tonight. Either y'all didn't know it or didn't remember it or something because there wasn't much of a fire while ago. So. <laughs> didn't know it, okay. Well, now you learned it. Go home and study that one. It is a good one. Set my soul afire because that's what we need. That's what we need tonight. We need our soul set afire to get out and, you know, make my life a witness to the saving power. You know, millions grope in darkness waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. That's what that's what it's all about. Yeah. Is getting out, reaching those, and you know, we need
need to strive to reach souls. That's God's mandate for us is to get out and reach those souls. You know, it's, it's recorded here in Acts 8 about getting out and reaching souls. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And there's, you know, we see a lesson from Philip. You know, there's three different lessons for striving together to reach souls. The scattering of saints, the spirit of the soul winner, and the salvation of the soul. Okay, Acts 1, Acts 8, 1 through 8. Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing, and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. First, we're going to look at the scattering of saints. You know, up to this point, most of the preaching and all was done inside Jerusalem, in that area. And with Saul going on this mission of his to do away with the Christians, he was causing havoc. He was, he was just giving the Christians a hard time every, every way he could. And so a lot of them a lot of the people, some of them hid, but some of, most of them fled, you know, fled to other areas. You know, they were trying to get away from the persecution, and that's what we would do today. We would try to get away, but you know, the devil was doing what he could to try to stop Christianity. You had the initial soul winners there, the initial Christians, and Saul was, you know, through the direction of the devil, was trying to squash it, just do away with it right there. Through his persecution, what he did, he scattered them. You know, that, that's what you know, sometimes, you know, if you drop all your seeds in one spot, you're not going to make much. But if you scatter them around, then it'll make more. Right. And the devil, he didn't realize or didn't think before he acted on this, because what he was doing when he scattered them, he was spreading what God wanted. God can make things good out of anything. Sometimes right. you know, we think it's bad, you know, the persecution, but God was making something good out of it. You know, even James, you know, he saw what they were going through, and he wrote a letter to them, you know, and said, James 1, 1 through 3, he said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greedy, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You know, James is just telling us, hey, hang in there. You know, it's, we all go through things. I look around, I see people all over this room that went through stuff. We all do. Job went through things. Jesus went through things, even when he's on this earth. But he, you know, he will be there and it will worketh to good for him. You know, they were scattered, but they were still preaching. You know, it's no surprise that they were scattered. You know, that makes perfect sense under the circumstances that they would leave. It's like we would do. We're not going We're not going to sit there if we can get away from something bad. We're going to try to get away. But, but what they did didn't really make sense. You know, said, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word couldn't stop them. They were excited. You know, their faith was so real to them. They wanted to let others know about it. It's like the new Christian. The new Christian, you know, we lose some of our scaredness and all when we're new Christians, then it don't take long and we get back and we're scared to reach out to others. But 
these Christians, they wanted to share their faith everywhere they went. You know, it was, you know, they wanted to let everybody know about the change Jesus had made in their lives. You know, as we're looking, you know, going into read more in chapter eight, you know, you'll see if you go do that, you'll see that they reach many cities and villages. So, you know, what Saul did, instead of it being them just spreading it among each other, now they were out all over the place spreading the word. That's the reason we support missionaries and other people today. It's not, you know, we still don't do a good enough job supporting, you know, and spreading the word even in our own area. There's people even probably within the side of this church that need the Lord. But then if we don't send people out to other places, they'll never hear the word either. Acts 8.25 says, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. You know, and this is just another example of God's ability to turn something to good that the devil had intended for evil. You know, Genesis 50.20 says, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called, are the called according to his purpose. You know, the devil wanted to shut them down. But they you know, he only added fuel to the fire. You know, what Saul and other persecutors thought would stop the spread of the message only furthered its reach. By scattering the burning coals of Christian witness, he made it possible for fresh fires to, of testimony to spring up elsewhere. We saw that with the forest fires last year. You know, it, it didn't stay in one place, did it? You know, the, wind, the winds can pick it up, take it, spread it. That's, Saul was wind in this case. He picked it up and spread it. It went to other places. You know, the great character list characteristic of the lives of those first century Christians was you couldn't ex extinguish the gospel light. They let it shine. And that's what we need to do. Like the, the song used to say, you know, don't hide it under a bushel, let your light shine. Yeah. One good quote I like is, the test of your character is what it takes to stop you. That's Dr. Bob Jones Sr. You know, just think about that for a second. You know, what does it take to stop you? That, that tells you a lot about a person, what it takes. You know, are they going to they gonna work and try to succeed at all costs or just one little simple setback shut them down? <coughs> you know, Saul, he learned commitment as a fir first-hand witness to these things in Acts 8. He saw, he was a witness to what he was doing there, you know, as he wreaked havoc on the lives of the people. He saw their commitment. He saw what happened, you know, and what he was trying to do wrong. You know, and it changed him. You know, later after his conversion, you know, then he accepted the Lord and started his ministry as Paul. You know, in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 11, he writes, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always de delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest mortal flesh. Isn't that a big turnaround? Going from the one doing all the persecuting, all the wreaking havoc against the Lord, basically he was defeated and changed and become a mighty warrior for God. He was a warrior against him and then become a mighty warrior for him. The next we'll see the spirit of the soul winner. You know, the early believers, they had a passion for Christ and they shared their Find that with their compassion for souls. You know, one that we hear of tonight is Philip. You know, his we'll see more about his soul winning efforts. You know, 
What kind of spirit did he possess which we could learn today? First is we must have a spirit of obedience. There's two reasons we must possess a spirit of obedience if we want to be the soul winner God wants us to be. First, the very act of witnessing is in obedience to Jesus Christ. He instructs us in Acts 1.8, you shall be witnesses. Plain and simple. We need to do that. We're commanded to do that. You know, we need to look at our lives. We need to look at what we do. Are we, are we doing what God wants us to do? Are we only doing doing what he wants us to do or what we think if we show up on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and you know, you got a bunch, it feels like it's you know, if you just look at there again, we'll go back to the numbers. Go back to the numbers and look. There's about three hundred and fifty feels like it's important to be here on Sunday morning. There's probably two hundred, two twenty five that think it's important enough to be back on Sunday night. It may be 100, 125 that thinks it's important enough to be here on Wednesday night. So, you know, and I mean, I know people have to work and so forth, but, you know, there's, there's things that we have to do, but it's all a matter of where we put our priorities and what we do in life. And God expects, he expects us to do what he's commanded us to do, not, not the things that we want to do. It's easy to get caught up in, in our worldly things and want to be there doing that, playing ball, fishing, shopping. I know all you ladies are shopping because it's Father's Day Sunday. <laughs> you know, I don't believe they are, men. Y'all are going to do without again this year. So <laughs> I put in a plug for you. So. But anyway, of course, they might remember what you got them for Mother's Day, so... I can't help you with that. But, you know, we got to be diligent in what we do. We got to get out there, you know, because if we're not living in obedience, we're being disobedient. Because right. it tells us right there what we're supposed to do. So if we're not doing it, if we're not living in obedience, we're living in disobedience. Because that's what Curtis Hudson said. He said, the only alternative to soul winning is disobedience to Christ. I never thought about it that way, but if we're not doing what he's commanding us to do, we're we're disobeying him. You know, we still have to learn to obey the still small voice of God. Amen. You know, we have to listen. Sometimes we have to listen hard. There's a fellow here last Wednesday night that you know, if you I was up there getting some batteries for a fellow in our church and walking around and the guy, he saw my Blue Ridge View staff shirt. He could come up and started talking. And if you've ever seen me anywhere, I'm usually in a hurry. I was in a hurry. And I just about didn't take time to sit there and share with that fellow. I mean, he's asking me. I didn't even approach him. He asked me. And I was just about too busy to sit there and talk to him. And I mean, I, you know, later on I, I really felt bad. I said, is, is that what am I supposed to do? You know, I knew what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to take time. You know, I could take time to do other stuff, but I needed to take time to talk to him. And he's, you know, he did come. You know, I invited him. He came last Wednesday night. But he's searching. He's searching for something. He, you know, he said he's 42 years old. He don't know what he needs to be doing in life. And finally, after I got out of my hurry-up mode, I sat there and talked with him, and I told him I because he actually lives over near Sakona. And I said, you know, Sakona's a good church. I said, the, the main thing you need to do, because he asked me, you know, what struck God, he said, what church or synagogue do I need to go to? And I, I just sat there and told him, I said, you need to go to a Bible-believing church and one that teaches you that the only, there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. And I said, there may be other things. There's a lot of good churches out there that teach that. I said, I think ours does a good job of it, but right. you know, you need to be in some church. I said, because that's where you're gonna get your direction and and that's where we learn to fall in and do these things. It's what we're teaching tonight. You know, it's, I'm as guilty as anybody. Like I say, last Wednesday I didn't what gonna slow down there long enough to do 
you know, I didn't really have anything to do other than to get back up here. Sit there and study some. But you know, that he was more important than any studying I would have done. You know, because that's somebody that, that's already got the fire of wanting to know something. So, you know, take that time sometime. Don't do like I did or almost did. You know, we, we get busy and we've got things we've got to do, but when that still small voice comes talking to you, listen to it. Take the time. You know, because we'll see, you know. Philip, you know, Philip listened to that small voice. He listened to the Spirit of God. In Acts 8, 26 through 28, it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south, to the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. 27, And he arose and went. He arose and went. Didn't say he thought about it. Didn't say, you know, well, he thought somebody else would do it. He didn't say, well, if I'll slow down long enough, if I can make time in my busy schedule. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chair, read Isaiah's prophet. You know, we see Philip's obedience a second time in verse 29. The Spirit says, go near, join thyself to this chair. You know, that's what he did. He went. He went right then. Verse 30, he follows the Lord's instruction once again. He does. But Philip is listening to what the Lord's telling him to do. He's doing that, and that's what we all need to do. You know, a lot of times, it's like that guy last Wednesday. The Lord has sent people. If we, you know, don't pray, I mean, you should. But if you pray, Lord, let me be a soul winner, or Lord, let me meet someone today that I can spread your gospel to. I guarantee you, you'll meet that person. Right. You know. Don't pray for something, you know, thinking you're going to get off the hook because you won't have to look hard. Somebody will come your way that cross your path, but you've got to be willing and ready when God sends that person your way. Proverbs 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. You know, he wants us, he delights when we sit there and do the things that he asks us to do. When he sends that one our way and we take the time and we reach out to that person, when we do that, it gives the light to the light to the Lord. D.L. Moody told the story of his conversion this way. He said, when I was in Boston, this is D.L. Moody, he said, when I was in Boston, I used to attend a Sunday school class and one day I recollect my teacher came around behind the counter of the shop I was at work in put his hand upon my shoulder and talked to me about Christ and my soul. I had not felt that I had a soul until then. I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here's a man who never saw me till lately, and he is weeping over my sins, and I never shed a tear about them. But I understand it now and know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and weep over their sins. I don't remember what he said, but I can still feel the power of the man's hand on my shoulder tonight. You know, that's D.L. Moody. That's how he come to know the Lord. You know, that's just through the concerns of a, and tears of a godly teacher. You know, it's a conversion of a man that end up seeing a million souls saved. What if that teacher had to took the time who, who are we holding back today because we've not done what God instructed us to do? We must have a spirit of urgency. In verse 30 it says, Philip ran thither to him. He didn't walk, he didn't lollygag, he ran to the Ethiopian. You know, it's been said before, delayed, delayed obedience is disobedience. Philip 
quickly responded to God's call. He ran. You know, if we really think about the brevity of life, the length of time, you know, the eternal consequences. I told Ms. Wade a while ago, I said, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about what we were just talking about before the service. You know, people don't, they don't think about, you know, we don't think about for others. I mean, sometimes I think we get complacent because we feel like we saved so what to the rest of them? You know, that's not my problem, that's their problem. But it is our problem. Right. God commands us to go out. We gotta, you know, we gotta sense that urgency. You know, we have to, because we never know. I mean, we saw on the you know, news today how many people died in shootings and accidents, car accidents, and all these different things that we don't know what their spiritual condition was. We don't know where they at now, but it could have been someone around them, or it could have been one of us that could have changed their life forever, their eternity forever. So we need to have that spirit of urgency, just like Philip did. You know, Jesus modeled this while he was on this earth. John nine four says, "I must work the works of Him that sent me, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work." You know, that's that's the way it is. We you know, we have a certain time, but we're not guaranteed forever. You know, must have a we must have a spirit of boldness. You know, imagine what this looked like then. This caravan with the Queen Candace of Ethiopia. You know, I would attribute it to probably be like trying to walk up to Air Force One with President Trump back then. You know, and this guy, the Ethiopian, you know, he was had great authority. He was over all this. And he was taking care of her. But with boldness, Philip walked up to him. You know, God give him that boldness. You know, God don't tell us, you know, well, you learn what to do and then I'll send you. God will send us. He'll give us the words. He'll give us what we need if we only use the boldness that we need to have. And then he'll make us even more bold because even if you think you're not learning nothing, if you in here, and you come regularly to God's house, and you go to Sunday school, and you come to worship, at least at Blue Ridge View Baptist, because if we got a teacher or a preacher or anybody here that's not teaching or preaching the word, we need to know about it, because that's not what we're here for, and that's not what we stand up for. But if everybody's doing their job, and I feel like they are here, you can't sit here and not learn something not learn enough gospel to be able to go out and be bold with someone around about you. It may, you know, it's it's tough. I'm not, I mean, I, I know y'all think, I mean, this, if you'd have seen me in high school and everything, I was the most shy person you ever seen. And it still scares me to get up here. I mean, for one, before I'm standing, because I have the biggest fear of saying something out of ignorance and lead somebody the wrong way. But we have to get up and do. And God, if I make a mistake, if I do it on purpose, he won't understand. But if I do it and I just make a mistake out of saying the wrong thing, he'll understand. He'll correct it. He'll take care of it. So he just wants me to do what he wants me to do. Same way with our lives. He wants us to do what he wants us to do. He, he will equip us the best he can for us to do what we need to do for him. The Ethiopian, he was reading the Old Testament scriptures. But, you know, Philip, he saw him reading the scriptures. And I mean, if we see somebody reading the Bible, we automatically think, well, they know what they're doing. They're a Christian. But Philip didn't do that. Philip asked him, said, Do you understand what you're reading? You know, it said Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandeth thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. You know, and Philip, he could have made all the excuses in the world. I don't have time. You know, this guy, he's he's a Bible believer. There he is reading the Bible. I don't need to talk to him. I need to talk to somebody else. But Philip understood the call that he had to go speak to this man. And, you know, the answer was, how should he understand? That's something. 
somebody helps them. And that's the way there's a lot of people out there in the world today. That's the way that guy was last Wednesday. He need, you know, he needs somebody to help him understand. And that's what we should be here for. You know, we need to skip the excuses and realize that we're children of God on a mission here to do what he wants us to do. Amen. You know, and God will help us on that mission if we just do what he wants. Matthew 28, 18. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. You know, when we out and do these things, there's no doubt that some, some will accept what we have to say. Some's going to reject it. Some's not even going to. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to have no part of what you're trying to say. But that ain't ours to, you know, that's not on us. If we're doing what he tries to do, we can't save them to start with. Only God can save them. All we got to do is try to plant that seed. We got to try to plant the seed, then take the seed up, then we got to try to water that seed. But, you know, once we tell them, then it's between them and God what they want to do, what they do. You know, our task is to give the message clearly, frequently, and boldly. All right, it's part three, but I'm going to leave that for the pastor. I see that I'm doing way more than y'all used to. <laughs> but we'll, we'll let him finish it up next. You know, the last part is the salvation of the soul. And we'll see you know, Philip and what he does and what the Ethiopian does. And, but y'all just take this. You know, it's, and I can say, I'm, as the preacher says, when you've got one forward, you got four coming right back at you. And that's the way it is with me. So I'm not, I don't think I'm any better than anybody. I'm probably worse than any of you here. But let's remember God and remember our mission. Christians, you know, if you're not a Christian tonight, if you've not accepted him, I hate to say it, but this is not for you. It could be for you, but tonight, you know, we're telling the Christians what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, but if you hadn't accepted him, tonight's a good night to do it, or is the night, and always remember that there is a better way. It sounds tough, but it's not. Christian life's a good life. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us come back to your house tonight. Thank you for just letting us be here, letting us learn more about you. Just let it sink into our hearts, Lord. Let us be more receptive. Slow down, take time. I know this is my worst problem. I need to do this more than anybody, but just take the time and see those around about us. And take the time to do the things that you want us to do. I pray that you'll be with all those that weren't able to be here tonight, those that's, that work in just different places. I pray that you'll just reach them, just help them, touch them, just strengthen us all. I pray again that you'll be with all the sick and needy, those that's just suffering around about us, us, those going through tough times. I pray that you'll just touch them in a special way. I pray that you'll be with each and every one of us as we come back to your house Sunday. I pray that you'll give us all the desire to be here. I pray that you'll help us to invite others and share with others and do what we're talking about tonight. Just bring others under the sound of your word. We'll give you the praise and honor and glory for it all. In 